good morning uh, everyone here. Uh, I think uh, we have a very interesting panel uh, talking about, I would say, financial services. Talk about payment and, uh, you know, and um, financing, but we'll talk about financial services in general. I think this panel has a very unique thing here. We have uh, one of the leading companies working in blockchain. We have uh, Saudi Bay. We have a gentleman or colleague from Saudi Arabia, the biggest country here for uh, economy as well as the highest uh, in terms of payment and uh, uh, cross-border transfer worldwide. And then we have one of the leading banks. So I think the, you know, the composition of the panel, I believe, will have some very interesting discussion here. I uh, would like to ask everyone to introduce himself, and then we can start the questions. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Vakas Mirza. I'm the CEO of Avanza. Uh, we're an 18-year-old company. Uh, for the past 18 years, we've been doing a lot of transaction processing, channel banking, payment solutions. Uh, two years ago, we launched a spin-off of the parent company called Avanza Innovations to focus on nascent technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence. Uh, and for the past two years, we've had some major successes in this space. Uh, we've delivered the first reconciliation and settlement platform for Dubai Smart Government and Department of Finance in Dubai. Uh, it is a production-grade blockchain implementation at a city-wide scale. We've got almost 12 million transactions on the blockchain now. Uh, we are helping a lot of government entities and financial regulators to implement blockchain in a private permission setup. We've deliberately stayed away from anything related to crypto. Uh, so all our implementations are private permission implementations, and we've carved out two areas for ourselves in the blockchain space. A, we work on digital government transformation where we help a lot of government entities achieve paperless automation uh, for their citizens and residents. And the other area is financial regulation and supervision. This is where we go to regulators and banking federations to implement a countrywide platform to solve a certain problem. I I'll go into the details of different we'll cases. Details. Uh, good morning, I'm Mahsin Zahrani, the VB of Strategy and Excellence of uh, Saudi payments, which is the payments arm of SAMA, the, the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, I am also leading all the SAMA uh, blockchain initiatives. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Abzal, uh, part of Emirates Innovators Innovation Office, uh, responsible for leading a small engineering team uh, within Emirates Innovators, primarily working on the emerging tech space. Uh, blockchain is one of the primary practice that the team is taking care and uh, and probably the other 50 percentage we work a lot on the API, a lot about the business models, partnerships and et cetera, et cetera. Probably in the recent, the last six months, uh, blockchain is one of the element and uh, another one particular area which we have recently done is probably we launched the, uh, probably banking in WhatsApp the last three months time and also we sort of released a, a sandbox for the fintechs and startups. So those kind of mostly emerging tech space falls into our uh, arm of work. Thank you. To stay with you, Afzal, so we can take it uh, this side. Uh, you know, like uh, Imra SMBD was the first bank or one of the first banks here in the region really to go and start working in blockchain. And I think the first use case, which everybody talked about it, was the cross-border transfer. And later on, you come with the check chain and you come with, you know, another payment uh, smart check with, with the real estate and so on. So I think there is very really unique, uh, you know, kind of uh, use cases you guys are working on it. Would like to know from you about the local use cases and this international use case, where we are from and what are the issues we are facing? Are we able really to have it as a B2C or a consumer to consumer or is the local chain for payments is really B2B today? Well, uh, <clears throat> our journey probably started roughly in 2015. Uh, Primarily 15 and 16, we primarily were doing a lot of exploration, experimentation. Uh, probably 17 is when we sort of started working on some uh, real-world use cases. Uh, one of which is check chain, which is now a production grade, which have already recorded roughly 24 million transactions between three entities. Uh, uh, we've been part of the uh, the Dubai uh, reconciliation project. Probably Vakas can pitch in at later on that we are one of the participants over there. And uh, on a remittance front, we are already piloting with uh, a network within India. We are doing quite a lot of work with uh, Ripple on an interbank transactions. But let me tell you the, 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 
the biggest uh, success factor that we see over here is uh, it's about a net network and a community, right? Bringing different parties together, uh, creating a, uh, creating a, a network or a consortium, uh, and bringing together a governance model around it is always considered to be one of the most uh, challenging and critical part of it. And if you ask, blockchain is just a 20% tech, right? Your 80% is business. It's about re-engineering, it's about reimagining, remodeling, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the primary uh, learnings that we had. Uh, the second one, um, um, and specifically on the smart check front, uh, or the most of the time we are working on a completely different operating model and the instruments and financial models, are, the underlying constructs are completely different. So most of the time bringing a legal element to it, right, bringing a, a regulatory framework around those instruments are the second or biggest challenge that we normally see. And third, obviously, is the, the faster, uh, because the technology is emerging so fast, the magnitude that it is growing day by day, is, it's really quick and we always sometimes get lost in terms of, you know, which one to choose and which one to ignore, right? So that's, that's probably one of the day-to-day -day challenges that we face from our three years of experience on this one. We'll come to the platform uh, after that. Uh, Mohsen, I think you come from uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, like I think the highest remittance country in the world. You could become number one for uh, money outflow and inflow, one or two sometimes. So I think Saudi also, they have very strong uh, payment system from beginning, Sadat and others. So I'd like to know from you, what is the development happening at your end? And if you can explain to us as well about the digital currency, which is really interesting to us to know about UAE and Saudi. I believe you have something to say here about it. Okay. We believe in Saudi we have a, a very good payment system in, in general and uh, local system of payments is very uh, efficient and very convenient after the, the, the uh, let's say NFC card payment is introduced now and mobile payment is introduced and all the new technology are introduced in the market so it is um, very seamless, very convenient to, to the people. However, we still believe that when it comes to the cross-border payment, there is a still very high friction in terms of cost and time and yeah. also tracking of, of the payment. And that is uh, because the way it was designed and depending on, on, on the corresponding banking relation, Nestro account, Nestro account, and um, it is said that there is uh, like 25 trillion US dollars sitting in those accounts, pre-funded, waiting for messages to, to arrive. Yeah. And, and that is a huge uh, inefficiency when it comes to, to money. So um, looking into the, the best use case to do a, a blockchain project, we, we have gone through different use cases and we, uh, we decided to uh, start with a, a cross-border use case because we do see more value comparing a, a blockchain solution to a centralized solution. Um, and also when we look into the uh, using of, a, of a, a blockchain, we believe that um, uh, a tokenized blockchain is, is, has more value because uh, you can fly in and fly out the money over, over the network. Uh, because from a, a central bank perspective, we, we do see that uh, digital currency can have two different sorts. One is uh, what we call uh, account-based digital currency, which is the regular account balances because they are still digital. And you can use your uh, mobile to make a mobile payment. And that is a still a complete digital payment. Yeah. And uh, the other sort of, of the digital currency is what we call uh, token-based digital currency. And um, we all know maybe the, uh, the features of um, a token based over the account based because yes, they yes. can uh, provide some features that account based can, cannot, um, uh, like uh, being able to be uh, used offline of, of the centralized system. That yeah. is uh, a fact. And um, uh, so we decided to. Um, um, bringing both sides, which is a cross-border payment and using a, a token-based digital currency, uh, we decided to do this project uh, together with Central Bank of UAE. Yeah. Uh, so um, we lately started the project, and uh, the project is, uh, is about uh, issuing uh, a cash-backed uh, 
digital currency, a token-based digital currency, uh, and it is a, a common currency that would be issued by both central banks, okay. and it would be uh, traded with, uh, or uh, let's say, exchanged between uh, banks. And that is specifically for uh, a wholesale payment, which is interbank payments. Uh, so it would be like between, a B2B? We'll, we'll between, between the banks. Between uh, banks. It, 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 it wouldn't be a, uh, like available for, for individual at, at least in, in this stage. Okay, so now if someone would like to transfer money from Saudi to UAE or US Saudi, Bank is themselves will use this currency most likely to transfer the money. They will not yes, the, the bank any need other to, network. Yeah, the, the bank need to buy the currency from the relative central bank uh, that they have an account in, and then use that currency to transfer with a local payment between the the, the domestic banks yeah. that are participating in this uh, pilot project, or they can also use it for a cross-border payment to a UAE. Uh, participant bank. And I believe this is the first, maybe you can say, a central bank, uh, a central bank digital currency, or is there any other uh, central banks done the same, like uh, there, what there Saudi are, are trying to do? Yeah, it, uh, there are different, um, uh, actually, central banks lately, they are looking into this uh, uh, central bank issued digital currency very right. seriously and very closely. And uh, actually, some central banks, they announced that they are going to issue a central bank issued digital currency, like Sweden and some other countries. You know. And some other countries, they already started um, uh, some um, uh, pilot project, like Open in Singapore, Jasper in, in Canada, and some other countries, they also there ha have their own uh, pilot project to issue a digital currency. However, we believe we are the first one that uh, will do this uh, jointly with another country, issuing a common digital currency for a cross-border payment. Yeah. And I believe uh, hopefully this will come around VCC. And I remember we were saying, okay, we're going to have a one currency in, in VCC. Maybe this will be the, the start to have a, a digital currency for, for VCC. We are now very focused on, on the use case we yes, have, which yes. is... Uh, uh, a currency for both the central okay. bank yeah. that is backed by cash yeah. and is exchanged between the, the pilot banks and uh, that is only for a wholesale and uh, parallel to this we are uh, doing some studies on, on this whether uh, from an impact of a, 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 a such currency on the financial stability or monetary policy or, or other regulation and rules and based on those, the result of those studies and based on the result of, of the proof concept uh, uh, program that we are doing on a technical part, we will decide what is the, the next stage of, of um, uh, implementation. Okay. Thank you. Well, we come to you, you know, like you are one of the pioneering companies here in, in the region. I remember a few years back when Mr. Saudi was talking about local chain, you were the first company to come, local company to come and talk about local chain. Uh, and you guys, right, put your hand on it and start, you know, like real doing the real work with the government here. And uh, you know, you give us your lesson learn it. And what is the project we are doing? I think you're doing something about bank trust as well. So there is more in the financial service, not only payments. So we'd like to know about this from you. And any any feedback about your your experience with what's happening in the local market? Okay, so like I said, uh, there are two areas in which we are implementing blockchain projects. One is digital government transformation. In those projects, uh, we are transforming different journeys that citizens and residents go through in a city. And the final leg of these journeys is often a payment. Because at the end of a service, there has to be a payment. And that's where you know our collaboration with Emirates NBD has been. Uh, that I mean, one of the projects that we are doing is to completely transform the leasing process, the property leasing process in, yeah. in Dubai. Uh, this project is being championed by Dubai Land Department. But Emirates NBD is the pilot bank yeah. because at the end of every rental agreement, you have to issue checks and that's where their products like e-check come in. Okay. So in these projects, the final leg of payment, there has to be a bank who has to have a node and endorse the transaction. So that's where our involvement in banks is. But besides digital government transformation, there are few projects that we are doing uh, for financial oversight. Uh, so one of the projects that we are doing is a bank trust network over here with uh, a banking federation over here. There are so many documents that are issued and received between banks. Uh, B2C documents and B2B documents, bank statements, demand drafts, LCs, bank guarantees. 
And typically, the way these documents are verified is that the receiving banks look at the document, look at the stamp of yeah. the bank and say, yeah, this looks okay, right? And they process the document. So we're providing a secure vehicle to a banking sector in a country where all these documents are issued and verified between different banks, at times with the customer's consent, because customer consent is important in this, and at times just because of the regulation. Yes. In some cases, we are riding on zero knowledge proof, which means the document really doesn't have to be shown to the receiving bank, but the receiving bank can verify that yes, this kind of a bank guarantee was issued and, and, and is on the chain. Along with this, there's another project that we are doing with the biggest bank in UAE, first Abu Dhabi Bank and Ita Salat. This is a platform to eliminate invoice discounting frauds in the country. Uh, we've got a few of these frauds, uh, the volumes are huge where an SME would get invoice discounting from one bank, and this SME would take the same invoice to bank number two, and then to bank number three, and then get financing from three banks on the same invoice, and then disappear from the country and never come back. Yeah. So this is a platform that we, we call it UTC, UAE Trade Connect. Uh, this is being launched as a service by Itisalat to the banking sector. Okay. FAB, First Abu Dhabi Bank, is the first bank that has come on board, and now there are around eight banks who have shown commitment to come on board. Now, this is a blockchain and AI play. I will refer back to the earlier panel discussion that you were having, that here, see, if you had a bureau model for this, if you would say all the banks that whatever invoices that you're getting from your different corporate customers, just dump them on a central server, nobody would agree to this, yes. right? Data protection and all that. So blockchain plays a very important role in giving this comfort to the banks that your invoices data is on your node. There's a trusted government-owned entity, Itasalat, who's the neutral party in this, who would fetch this data from the node and then run their ML models to make sure that such an invoice doesn't exist in the system. Because the people who do these kind of frauds, they become very creative. They would change the invoice a little bit when they'll present it to a second bank or a third bank. So there's a lot of fuzzy matching that is involved in this. So that is why this is a proper marriage of blockchain and AI. This is another implementation that we are doing. And the third one is, is EKYC. EKYC is, is a very popular use case in yes. the financial sector. It's a no-brainer when it comes to blockchain. If a bank has done the KYC of a customer, or any entity for that matter, if a telco has done a KYC or a government entity has done a KYC, the other organizations should be able to consume it. Yes. And KYC is an ongoing process. It, it's not as if it stops. There are renewals and, and you know, it keeps on happening. So the system keeps getting richer, and the people, such as the regulators, have a superset of a national KYC. So these projects are of national interest as well. You know, they'll curb on AML and, and terror financing and these kind of things as well. So they, they have very long-term implications. Yes. Uh, since we're talking with you here about technology, uh, I think interoperability is an issue here among different platforms. I think you've been doing, doing some work here. Remember in our discussion that you can have some kind of middleware at a time, just some more technical side. Maybe we're doing, uh, you know, hyperledgers and Ethereum and, and, and there is lots of things around how can we will you know, integrate it. So I think there is some solutions and we will uh, start working on it. Maybe this is out of the financial service, but for us as technologists, sometimes we, we say, okay, there's too many systems around. How can we talk to each other? So from your experience being, uh, you know, doing some work during the series, what is the best way to bring all these different platforms together? Is there anything you can shed light on that? Oops. The middleware or this is something that we had foreseen when we started our blockchain journey yeah. two years ago. We could foresee that four to five years down the road, every organization will have multiple blockchains hosted in their environment. Yes. Right? Sama, for example, might be championing a couple of blockchain use cases in which you will have the uh, luxury to choose a technology. You might say, let's, let's do this with Ripple or let's do this on Hyperledger. In some cases, Sama or Emirates NBD for that matter, will be part of a bigger blockchain consortium, global yeah. or regional, yeah. in which the technology decisions have been taken. True. So Emirates NBD or Sama or any other organization would have a node of Ripple, a node of Hyperledger, and yes. another node of Quorum. And if the core systems are tightly coupled with these underlying blockchains, it's a very messy architecture That's true. for multiple reasons. A, these technologies are evolving. I remember the first POC that we ever did was on Hyperledger Fabric 0.6. And when Hyperledger 1.0 came on, came in, Fabric, it was a completely different world. There was no backward compatibility. Now, if you're writing your smart contracts tightly coupled with your ERPs, you'll have to go back and make a lot of changes. Yes. Similarly, you'll have different, you know, blockchain adapters. So that is why when we started our blockchain journey, we started it with a product, our own product called Cypher, which is a blockchain orchestration and governance platform. 
we've got adapters for Hyperledger Fabric, Quorum, Ripple, all of the prevailing blockchain platforms. And there's a lot of governance that goes into it. Yes. Uh, I mean, there might be some technical people in the room. So even today, when you have to deploy a smart contract on Hyperledger Fabric, you do it through command line. Where does all the security of blockchain come in? Yes. So the champion of a use case could code anything in the smart contract and deploy it for all the other participants. So in Cypher, what we do is we've got an endorsement policy. Once a smart contract is deployed, it has a workflow by which it goes to all the participants, they endorse it, and only then it becomes it comes in effect. So there's a lot of governance and there's a lot of orchestration which abstracts the ERPs and existing systems uh, from the underlying blockchain. That's it. That was I think very technical. Very <laughs> because you know, like having so many uh, developments happening, we're still in. Uh, stage one or zero in the blockchain. So I think this uh, interoperability is, an, is a very important that we look at it from our architecture point of view. Um, uh, you know, our class talked also about something about AI. The previous uh, session was about AI, and I need to add here AI, IoT, blockchain. Blockchain by itself, you know, yes, do a great job, but you really need to bring many other things which really can have a, a big value. AI, IoT, IoT is also doing something great. I would like to go some more technical event about the but really technical, I was the selection of the platform. Since yesterday, we've been discussing permission, permission list, and so on. I know talk about banking, financial services. We will still, you know, uh, you know, worried or we don't know about this, this blockchain yet. You talk to the CEO, see what's blockchain. You know, tell me what's the business. You know, so you cannot tell him, okay, I'm gonna put everything on the cloud and public and so on. Even cloud computing, public and banking, we cannot do it. So from Azal and uh, Mohsen. Your point of view in choosing the platform, you know, how did you choose the platform? I believe maybe you do a proprietary, you, you done some work. You can enlighten us about the platform for financial services. What, what's your point of view? So <clears throat> it's not sure that we have the, always we have the opportunity or the liberty to choose a platform because most of the time we become part of a network, right? Okay. That's, that's the primary yes, factor. But if you have to step back from my expertise, I would say, so when we started our journey on CheckChain, uh, which was completely homegrown product, uh, uh, we picked up Quorum, which is the JP Morgan's Ethereum spin-off, uh, and the entire product was uh, built in-house. All right. Yeah, I see. Right. So our engineers built this entire thing, and the journey was it's pretty interesting one in, in terms of the product evolution, product development, and everything. Then we worked in the use cases such as uh, reconciliation project, uh, the Dubai real estate one. Uh, we sort of you know start working on the hyperledger part. And then there is uh, an opportunity that we worked in one of the networks where, which is a proprietary a blockchain platform, which is a spin-off of Bitcoin, which again, uh, the team got an opportunity and you're back to work on it. Ripple is another one, <coughs> right? But I'll tell you the, 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 if you have to step back and choose a platform, one or two criteria that I would consider. Number one would be, I think one of the most important one is the community support. Considering that you know, most of these plat platforms are open source, right? Um, um, having an open source one with a strong community support would be a, a number one um, uh, criteria for me to choose a platform as such. Mm -hmm. Number two, the, the again, the, it's, it's very use case driven, right? The, the, the constructs or the transaction behavior in every use case is completely different. There are some are which are very, for, for probably for creating an arbitrary digital asset sort of a use case, Hyperledger may fit into a strong one. But if you want to move into a more or less like a, a, a transaction driven sort of a thing now, I see Corda is sort of you know getting a lot of attraction in many areas. And yeah. even if, uh, as rightly said by Mohsin, a lot of the central bank uh, issue digital currency around the world, a uh, significant number of implementations are happening on Corda because the privacy and the, the, the kind of consensus that works around yeah. it is extremely uh, different from a hyperledger part, right? So that's the, the second piece. And the third one I would consider um, uh, having an enterprise support. Because when, when we're having this kind of open source community driven project, uh, sometimes we get lost in the how an enterprise can uh, do that. In that way, Hyperledger is fantastic because they've created a, uh, uh, an alliance called Enterprise Ethereum Alliance who kind of governs that entire process. Uh, we are part of uh, that group and participate in many discussions in terms of building the product and development. So that sort of, you know, gives a lot of support. But when we go back to our journey on the quorum front, community support is almost absent, right? When, when we hit some roadblocks in the past in terms of the technical challenges and issues, it was very difficult to, for, to, to, to find out. So that's how we probably the primary three criteria that, you know, we would, we would consider. 
But if you look at in this region, most of the implementations, considering we are the participant and a participating bank, most of the implementations are happening on Hyperledger. So you can be in the position of saying you have different, uh, yeah, it's you are part of different, you know, uh, look at chain different uh, networks, platform. right? Yeah, and then you have to manage it at your end. Mohsen, you would you feedback on that one yeah. if you have something to add? Yeah, I think it's very heavily dependent on 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 the use case itself and, and the business requirement. Um, in our case, um, uh, privacy is a key and security is another key. Yes. So we are looking into the, 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 the platform that can support this. Uh, also because it's an interbank uh, settlement system uh, using a, a digital currency. So there are some interbank or RTG system features that we want to include in this like uh, uh, liquidity management uh, resolution grid like and those kind of uh, yeah. challenges, which is not easy to implement on a decentralized uh, platform. Yeah. So we are also looking into um, the, the, the platform that supports all of those features that we are looking for, that is uh, still maintaining uh, the promise of decentralization of, 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 of the system and also can provide the level of privacy and security that we are looking for. However, in general, we are uh, exploring uh, the, uh, let's say, the most mature platform that we have mentioned, Hyperledger, uh, Ethereum, uh, and, and, and Corda. So we are exploring all those. You are using solutions. also Ribble for cross-border transfer. Like you are the first central bank to to go for Ribble, right? I think the only central bank which has done some kind of... Yeah, uh, uh, that, is, that is a different project. Yeah. And, um, um, Actually, that is also uh, looking into the cross-border payments. Yes. However, in, in, the, uh, in, in the project that we have with, with uh, Ripple, uh, we don't, as a central bank, we don't uh, implement uh, any technology. It's, uh, it's uh, banks, commercial bank, who are implementing the technology. Yes. Uh, however, we choose to start this uh, project uh, as an approach we used in, in SAMA. We call it central bank-led innovation. Yes, and, and that is how we started some innovative uh, initiatives from SAMA itself as a central and uh, encourage the banks to, to use the innovative technologies and the, the new technologies. And um, we chose uh, Ripple at that time because they have a very focused use case. Yes. So it, it, it is not uh, related to the technology, it's more related to the use case itself and and the focus of, of the company in the cross-border payments. Uh, and because, as, as you mentioned before, that uh, we are, uh, uh, the outgoing remittances is, is very high in, in Saudi. So um, uh, we started the program. So Sama was leading the program. We were steering it. Um, also, we uh, do the training for all the banks on uh, deep deep dive training on, on the blockchain and, and Ripple technology. And the bank themselves, they started the, the implementation of the technology based on different use cases that were discussed in, in, in the program. And uh, the bank started using actually the technology on production. In, in the last oh, really? few months, we had one bank who went live in, in production using uh, Ripple X current. Another bank is going very soon, and we have two more banks going also in, in this first quarter of 2019. I think this is great also bringing a competition because I can see the SWIFT as well, because we talk about payment. SWIFT started doing something also, I think, in blockchain, because now we have Rebel in blockchain. SWIFT is the traditional way. So I'm trying to see, you know, like who will win the battle, you know, between the two, and look for consumer at the end of the day. So uh, hopefully we'll see how the river will do and how it, if Swift will move to look at chain as well. I, I think the cross-border market is a huge market that is not one provider can, can capture the whole market. But till now Swift was capturing. So we now see with, uh, Swift is there. Um, uh, also bank-to-bank uh, -bank, uh, yeah, right. APIs, direct APIs are there. Uh, Ripple is coming transfer wise and there are many other companies some of them are using blockchain and some are using traditional technology at, uh, yeah, in this space. For us since you work with smart by government and we are going to act in some use cases when do you think me as a consumer here I will do a transaction on blockchain 
and uh, I will not know, but it's a blockchain, like leasing, like whatever, because you work with, uh, with the government in many use cases. So how can you, like, when you think that we as consumer can really do something on blockchain? Okay, so uh, there's already precedence for consumers uh, taking advantage of this technology. So, I mean, there are projects like Bitpesa in yeah. Kenya, which is, which is a decent success, you know, yes. where they're in Africa, obviously, there's, there's a huge problem of people sending money cross-border as also, you know, within a country. So Bitpesa is, is a decent success story where they've, uh, if, you know, managed uh, cryptocurrency-based transfer of funds cross-border and everything. So, so like Mohsin was saying, the market will not be taken over by one or two big players. There will yes. be these regional players as well who will go and, and address these pain areas for consumers. See, this is very interesting that how will we benefit from the technology? I was watching a video clip from the 80s in which on CNN, so this is not like a small news channel, top news anchors and technology specialists were discussing internet. And the discussion was about what is the significance of at the rate sign in the email address. And that was like a big topic for them back in the 80s because internet was coming on and they were saying, but why did we, do we have to use www and why do you have to have this strange letter in the middle for an email address? This is the stage where blockchain is right now. That's right. We're discussing things which will not matter to consumer. So with Dubai Smart Government, their objective is to transform customer journeys and resident journeys. So one of the projects, that the one that we are doing jointly with Emirates NBD and Dubai Land Department, that will enable me as a resident of the city to either complete a new tenancy contract or renew a tenancy contract within 10 minutes sitting in my home or in my office. As opposed to signing a tenancy contract today, writing out checks, going to the land department to get the Ajari certification then, then driving to the Diva Electric and Water Authority, getting the you know, electricity from my house yeah. and then driving to Ita Salat and do to get the internet and, and TV connection in my house. All of this will be done sitting at my desk within 10 minutes. As a consumer, I don't really care whether blockchain is being used and where it is being used. That's true. So I think the, the smart city projects and digital government transformation projects will have blockchain pieces in it, which will benefit the consumer in more than one ways, in, in making these journeys more frictionless and paperless, and you know we won't have to drive around in the city in 45 degrees heat and look for parking in 10 government organizations. And in some cases, blockchain will be playing a role, but in some cases, it will be other technologies playing that role. So, so when these journeys are being stitched together, it's a combination of blockchain and non-blockchain. But we will start seeing these benefits very soon. That's, that's true. Uh, now we'll go back, I think, Future Lab in, uh, in uh, Emirates MBD. You have, you know, more stuff you are doing, even in, I think, in IoT, you are doing something with payment and so on. Like, people can go to the station, you can do, uh, you know, uh, many other of the payment automation will happen at uh, Emirates and is trying to mo make futuristic, you know, use cases. Is there anything you can, you know, like, uh, which you guys will take it to book a chain more than the checks and payments which is happening you know, nowadays? I think you have some products which you said it's something on the con conceptual as of today. So is there anything you could like to, to, to share with us of that? Yeah, so on the blockchain space, I think one of the projects which we are working with the government is on the KYC front, which sort of we have recently concluded uh, an end-to-end -end POC with around nine banks. So that's what something on conceptualization that you will see uh, will rolling out soon. Uh, trade is, is one bigger piece we always wanted to crack, but again, uh, trade is so complicated as such, you know, it needs a uh, significant amount of you know collaboration between parties so we sort of have a a, a lot of discussions are happening on that front we are doing some work okay. um, uh, we are trying to be part of some of the international networks so that's one area the sort of uh, work is happening uh, and an immediate front on the um, on the uh, on the digital uh, onboarding front right in terms of you know uh, uh, especially on the machine vision side we are working on quite a lot of initiatives in terms of, you know, uh, face and voice biometrics surrounding it. So one of the initiatives, in fact, we launched uh, two months back is the behavior biometrics. So, um, uh, which is probably one of the very interesting implementation in terms of, so even if you, if I lose my phone, and if even if you know my, your, my password, my all the details, yeah. still you are unable to log in. 
uh, uh, because there is a biometric footprint algorithm has been built completely and you know adapted to your all India experience. This is something which is already running with around 500 staffs as we speak. So there are some engagements that we are doing. And on a far-fetched front, uh, it's too early to talk, but um, a, a small team, um, um, I would say small team, probably two very specific experts. We are sort of, you know, working with some international academia on the quantum computing front. Uh, our cyber security team is heavily involved in that area. So that's something probably we may not see on 18, 24 months, but uh, we are putting some sort of an effort on that front as well. So that's that's primarily we are. As well, I believe in your labs, you are allowing, uh, you are allowing fintechs to come and work with you. Yes. This is very important actually. We have seen now in the payment, you can see like before, it was under impression everybody is that okay, fintechs will take the whole market. And then now we have, uh, you know, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, everybody's on blockchain nowadays. You have major projects. Then we have major banks you have on blockchain. We have now all of these players, big players, with fintechs and innovators are all in place. So I can see it like, there is lots of is there collaboration or there is um, competition from your point of view because you have a lab as well and you are allowing fintechs to come and work with you. Is there any fintechs from blockchain or something which is your Yeah, so with? let me answer in two parts. Number one for the fintechs over here, right? So we we have a uh, we have got two practices within our innovation office. One is the the fintech and partnership arm, which where um, 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 any sort of you know so we have a very strong framework in terms of you know how do we engage, how do we onboard them the entire you know evaluation process so that is something uh, which is already in place and we've been already engaged with many accelerators on that front there are uh, uh, even this biometric example is one of the uh, production grade fintech integration example uh, and the second one is the engineering arm where we do the cooking inside right so that's how we position ourselves so anybody who wanted to engage you can enter into either of these two funnels right the second question on the fintech front, uh, yes, we see them as a competition, right? There's no doubt about it. Because even if you look at the payment space, uh, I think what I understand internationally, the banks have lost roughly 40% of their market share on the payment space, right? Yes. And if you look at it, Visa and MasterCard, and probably in the Visa itself in the last year, they have gone 50% high in their stock price because the, the, the aggressive mergers and acquisitions they've made with numerous fin uh, fintechs around the world, right? So definitely, you know, they're sort of, you know, grabbing the market. Um, uh, and there's an alternative world is also happening where, you know, I mean, again, we look into the payment space, you know, these kind of blockchain networks and everything which are, so it's very interesting. There's one space which are scaling very fast through yeah. fintechs and there's another space which are, which is sort of, you know, focusing a lot on building the networks and trust. So at some point in time, I hope this all will merge, you know, uh, to have a unified experience. That's, that's great. Yeah. Mohsen, I think that, you know, when you talk to look at chain or any innovation uh, regulation become, you know, I think the first thing people talk about it, which is true. Especially for something very new, like blockchain, and they still in early days would say it's, it's from 2008. But still the use cases, you know, getting matured and so on. We're not seeing something on production yet, but hopefully this year we'll see there's some already. So from your point of view, you know, what is the regulation? Is the regulation helping or the regulation is slowing a little bit? So because everybody's saying regulation, regulation, which is sometimes yes, sometimes no. From your point of view, you know, I think Sam is also very aggressive. I, I think it is very risky to regulate something that you don't understand. And that, yes. that is why many central banks, they start trying to understand the technology itself before yeah. they regulate it. Because if they start regulating it before they standard, standard, uh, understand the technology itself, that is very risky course, on yeah. fintech and technology itself. Uh, that is why in SAMA we, we, we started those different projects in, in the space. We also opened the, the, the regulatory sandbox. Uh, and the objective of that is, is to learn about the technology and being very close to the the ecosystem of, of, of this technology before going to, to, to the regulation itself. Okay. Uh, this is one part. And the other part, when we talk about regulation of a, of a, a blockchain, I don't think uh, we should itself. regulate the technology it's itself. A it's, it's a it's, uh, like, more yeah. in a use case perspective. Uh, you need to have uh, that goes, some of that goes under the privacy maybe regulation. Some of it goes under uh, cyber security regulation and other, uh, other, uh, uh, other, uh, other regulations. So uh, um, when it comes to SAMA as a regulator, it, it will regulate what goes under the financial 
part yes. and make sure that the current regulation uh, related to the uh, KYC, AML, and other regulation are in place and make sure that that is all, all, all there and, and, and the technology can support the compliance of those uh, current regulations. I believe it's very important to mention as well that it's uh, also some responsibility lies with uh, look with uh, fintechs or with the banks and so on. Anything new, you have to take it to regulator, you know, educate them, work with them. Don't sit at your, at your end and say, okay, yeah, okay, I'm just, just a regulator, you know. You have to understand. That's a very quick uh, note. Uh, one of the companies here in uh, New E uh, was working in beer to beer, and I, I think the only company is very successful. We work one and a half year without regulation, and I ask, how come you didn't do? I'm a banker, you know. He said, we'll make sure that we're not doing anything wrong, but we went to regulators and we talked to them. It took us one year working with them till we get regulated. So it's not only a responsibility of the regulator. We have to work with them, educate them, educate ourselves, they will get their help as well, so we can go ahead. I think now we need to get, we can have some questions, if you like, um, one of the questions here to the panel, please. Then we can, uh, you know, conclude. If you have a question, then we'll, okay, yes, please, here. Good morning, and this has been very informative. Uh, my name is Sinclair Skinner. Thank you. Uh, we have a startup, Bitmari, that uh, does the cross-border transmissions from the United States to Zimbabwe. Oh, okay. And uh, one of the issues that we face is dealing with uh, OFIC and U.S. sanctions. There's a lot of uh, issues, and this causes a lot of economic uh, problems. We were able to get a reserve, uh, the Zimbabwe Reserve Bank, to give us a license to actually use Bitcoin on ramp in order, and then with a uh, local bank partner, an indigenous bank, uh, Agribank, we were able to allow uh, recipients to receive funds from those uh, uh, Bitcoin originated transactions at tellers. I, I think uh, for the gentleman from Saudi Arabia, you know, dealing with some of the things you see institutions uh, are doing uh, with working with the West, working with the United States. Is there any advice, and I know this might be a loaded question, but any advice, you know, for in, in Zimbabwe, where we're trying to use technology, and sometimes, again, when you're dealing with corresponding banks that are being, may restrict the use of the dollar, maybe ways that technology can be used to help folks, get, right, I'm, I'm leaving for Zimbabwe tomorrow, and there's a big uh, gasoline crisis, so I want to come with some good advice when I sit down and meet with folks. Uh, the best advice I can give as a central bank is that know your regulator. So, so <laughs> the same way we do in central bank and say know your customer. Okay. I think technology, fintech, and companies they need to know their regulator. Okay, and that means they need to understand the current regulation, and they need to talk more and have this open dialogue and and collaborative dialogue with their regulator to understand this regulation and see how can the technology over can overcome of, of some of those challenges. That one of the challenges of the cross-border payment is that the different regulation in, in, in the different countries. So when it comes to a cross-border payment, you have completely new challenges that you don't see on domestic payments, including that you are dealing now with two different currencies and you have to do all of those foreign exchange in, in the middle, which add cost to the customer and complexity. Uh, you have uh, different, uh, sometimes different local system. So having something that can integrate or interoperabilate both system is, is not an easy thing to do. And the third one is that the, the regulation and sometimes in, in those countries are, are different. And, 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 and that is an, another challenge. So knowing your regulator and making sure that you comply with, with, with the current regulations and making sure is, is, is the advice I can give uh, to any fintech in, in the space. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this uh, session and thanks a lot for my panelists for uh, the great insights. And we're looking forward next year we are here inshallah and have more use cases read what's happening in, in, in this. Thanks a lot, thank, thank you. you.